Amen. Amen. God is good? Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter number 2. Matthew chapter number 2. If, you, uh, if you're not a Christmas person, you miss a lot. This is a beautiful season. And uh, I know I'm telling a story that has probably been told many times. But it's the one that the Lord kind of laid on my heart. So if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 2, we'll begin reading in verse 1. If you'll stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. I love that. We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, but thus it is written by the prophet. For thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. That's a miracle, folks. Went before them till it came and stood where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child and with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Let's pray. Father, uh, we have read your scripture many times. We've heard the story of the wise men. and We are grateful for their lives and the testimony that they bring of the arrival of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And Lord, I pray that today you would do again afresh and anew the work of the word of God. I pray that, Holy Spirit, that once again you would speak truth into our life. And as it has been for all these 2,000 years, Lord, that we would hear the story of Jesus, and Jesus, that you would be high and lifted up. Holy Spirit, proclaim his majesty. Holy Spirit, as only you can, speak it tenderly and lovingly and truthfully to our hearts. And Lord, as it's been done so many times, may we react and be drawn close to you. May we can find the riches of heaven and let them find their place in our heart. Father, bless as only you can. In, you, in your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. This story is an old story. But literally, it begins about 600 years before what we see here in Matthew chapter 2. So for us to really know the story, we have to go back to the, the days of Israel and where Israel had become two kingdoms, Israel of the north, Judah in the south, two kingdoms. We see there that Israel in the north had been conquered by this land called the Assyrians. They had been taken into captivity because they had left the one true God and become a people of idolatry. And in the south, the Assyrians came against them too, but they could not conquer because God had something else planned for them. But there was a land from the east. We would call them Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar the king. And he came against Jerusalem and he uh, built these siege mounds against them and conquered Jerusalem. And he took the best of the land. He left some to take care of the land. He didn't want there to be chaos there, but he wanted them to be part of the kingdom of Babylon. But he took the best of everything that 
that Israel had to offer, the wisest of the young people, and took them back into captivity. You may know some of them. We have obviously know about Daniel and Ezekiel. Some were left behind to prophesy, Jeremiah and others, Habakkuk. There were those who just did not understand all of the reasons why God would allow that to happen. As a matter of fact, Habakkuk, the prophet, was really mad and angry at God. Why would you do this? And God told Habakkuk what we need to remember and know and realize is that God loved the people of Babylon just as much. And he shared with Habakkuk, he said, look, this is the reason why I've allowed them to come in and conquer. This is the reason why people like Daniel were allowed to go back so that God could raise up people for himself there as well. I'm grateful that God loves me. I'm grateful that the gift of heaven has been given to someone as undeserving as me. But listen, God loves others just as much. There is something that needs to continue on and continue on and continue on. It is the mission. It is the thrust of Christ in the world. It is what the church should be about, is telling others that there is a king that we need to bow to, that there is a God who came for us, there is a Savior, and his name is Jesus. That's what New Holland is to be about. That is what the story of Christmas is about. That's what we as a Christian people are to be about, is to tell others that there is one named Jesus. We hear today in this story in Matthew 2, a story about some people who came from the east called wise men. Not wise guys, wise men, different group. They were called, the word we would say, magi. They were the thinkers from the land of Babylon. They were the elite. They were the people of science. They were the people of medicine. They were the people of astrology, studying the stars, the heavens that God had made. They were people of religion. They would people today we would describe them as some that, that studied psychology because they were very much in the interpreting of dreams. And when the Daniel and others came to Babylon, they came with the, the truth of the one true God. And they understood that they were taken into captivity because they had not been faithful. But they were faithful to God there. And they made an impact there. And people like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Daniel and others were put into the, the test of so that others would see that God is worthy of our praise. Every day we go through things. We studied this in, in our Sunday school class this morning that Lance teaches. We studied that bad circumstances happen to good people. But when we react in good ways that God would have for us, it makes an impact on others around that are watching. And by the way, they are watching. And they came to Daniel. Daniel was lifted up as a, as a governor, a, as a leader in a pagan land. Wasn't the first time God did this. He did that with Joseph down in Egypt too. You think God's about telling the good news to everyone? Well, it made an impact on them. And yes, the Mesopotamian Empire came in and destroyed Babylon. The Persians were in charge for a while. And then there was this guy by the name of Alexander the Great with the Greek Empire, and they came in and ruled the world for a while. And then the ones called Iron, the Roman Empire, they came in and they took over the known world. And yet, there was still this group in the east, in Babylon, the Magi were still doing, still seeking wisdom, still under, try, trying to search for truth. Listen to me, church. Here's the thing that I want you all to remember. I want you all to know that God has put a curiosity in all of us for truth. God has put a curiosity for knowledge within us. And we search for it in many ways. But you're going to truly find meaning when you understand that there's something bigger than you. 
Lost people worship themselves. America worships itself. They called us a Christian nation. We're not a Christian nation. We are, we are a nation that has Christians in it, but we've turned our back upon many of the things and the fundamentals that our nation stood for. And just please understand this. This is not a prophecy. This is a reality. If we do not turn our hearts back to God, God will let us reap what we've sowed as a nation. But I'm grateful that in this nation there are still people seeking truth. And those magi were there. And in a point in time, I can just see it. They're, they're together. And, and, and I'll talk more about this some other time. I don't have time for, for time constraints. I don't have time to go into this. But, but the stars align just right. Science actually amens this now. When, when Saturn and Mars got together in a certain place, they could see a new star. Don't you just love it when science backs up what the Word of God's been saying all along? Matter of fact, it said it 800 years before this. Before this. 200 years, time and again. In, in, in the Psalms, this was told to us. 600 years before Matthew 2, Daniel told them exactly when the king would come. Daniel chapter 9 Verse 25, he gave an extremely specific timetable that if you had understanding, you would know. And isn't it funny, when they saw the star, one of them probably said, hey, 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 go get the writings, go get the script. What was it Daniel said? And they looked at it. And the king, the God king, the savior, who would reign with peace, who was told to them, they said, here it is. Here's his sign. And they began a journey to the land where the Israel people were living again, seeking this one that had been told to them six centuries before. Well, when they get there, they find, they go to the capital, Jerusalem, and they find a person by the name of Herod there. Uh, by the way, I don't want to spend much time about Herod. I don't like him. Is that fair? When I get to heaven, he won't be there. I know I'm supposed to love everybody, but y'all give me just a break. I'm still, tr I'm still troubled by Satan. Amen? And a few others. But they called him Herod the king or Herod the great, there wasn't really anything great about him except he was a builder. Like Solomon, he loved to build things. Herod loved to build things. And, and the temple had been built before when they came back from Babylon. It had been constructed. But, but Herod took on the reconstruction, the remodeling of the temple to bring it up into a beautiful way. Now, he didn't do this because he loved God. He wanted the, the people, the Jews, to follow him and to make it easy for him. He really cared about his reign. As a matter of fact, historians tell us about Herod that he was a very vile person, that any rival he would extinguish as quickly as possible, including killing his wives. He had over 10. His siblings, even though after his death, one of his sisters became one of the rulers, he even killed his children. We are told about Harry that, that a short time before he died, he gave the order that his own son would be killed because he did not want his own son to take his throne. You call that being a control freak? He wanted everything in life was about him. He wanted those people to follow him and to worship him. Well, look what it says in verse number three. When Herod heard this, what the wise men said, they were coming to, they'd seen the star and they came to worship this new ruler, he was troubled. Tr trust me, he understood there was a rival here and I've got to do something about this. But then he goes on to say, and all Jerusalem with him. There was a buzz in Jerusalem about 
this Christ child, the Messiah child. And they didn't know what to think about it either. This would matter 30 years later. 30 years later when Christ would come to the, to the place where John the Baptist was baptizing and, John, and, and Jesus was baptized there, not because he had done anything wrong, but he was trying to tell the story of, of salvation even from the beginning of his ministry. But, but John said, this is the one. This is the one whose sandals I'm not even worthy to loose. Do you think somewhere in the back of their mind, the story started to come together? Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin will bring forth birth. All those stories uh, of Mary and Joseph and, and, and she, her proclaiming that she was a virgin and, and Joseph proclaiming it and telling everyone in the family, do you think those things started to come together? Maybe not fully understanding yet, but would understand. So there's a buzz all through town. So Herod gets the scribes together and says, where is this going to happen? They turn to Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. Bethlehem, one of the smallest. God doesn't overlook the small folks. I, I love that. Thank you, Mark, for what the choir sang this morning. And, and I, I, I do pray. I, we, we say this quaintly, that Jesus is the reason for the season. But I, I, I want you to know what, what the choir is saying is true. If it were only you in need, Christ will still come for you. I don't know that we believe that, do we? I mean, it sounds good for us to say it, but do you really believe that if you are the only one, you matter so much to God that he would still come because of his love for you? Just one? We would say, why would God go to all that trouble? And God would say, what trouble? The plan of love was there. And by the way, it's still there for one heart at a time, one soul at a time that will seek him and accept him. The love of God is there. We just have to receive it. It's beautiful and it's wonderful. So then Herod secretly calls the wise men together and he says, when did this star appear? They told him he's forming a plot. Verse 8, he sent them to Bethlehem. And listen to his words. Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Now, the word there means to have regard, but he didn't have regard. You know what he was wanting, don't you? If he would kill his own children, his own spouses and siblings, because he thought they were a rival, he said, I got a, the law of Barney Fife. I got to nip this in the bud. I got to get this quick. But I got thinking about verse 8. Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you found him, bring back word that we may worship him also. Go and search carefully. Search carefully for the young child. When you found him, there are others that need to hear about him. Bring him back with you so that we may worship him also. Church, we're supposed to be seeking after Christ. Many of us were introduced to Christ when we were a child. Um, my earliest memories in church were being a little boy in a play. I was a shepherd. That meant I had a towel on my head and a bathrobe. <laughs> Amen? Can anybody agree with me on that? We have any other shepherds in here? I remember when I graduated when I was no longer a shepherd because shepherds didn't have lines. You just walked up there and stood with a stick in your hand. And I remember when I graduated up where I got to be Joseph. I thought that was a big deal. He had two lines, which I mumbled my way through. That's my earliest memories. In our culture today, we do live in the Bible Belt here in the South, but we do hear a lot about Christ. We do hear, especially this time of year, the, the things of the Lord. 
We went to uh, do the Good News Club at White Sulphur. It was tough sharing some of those things that we take for granted here in the church. Wasn't it, Darn? Oh, come let us adore him. They'd never heard that. No clue whatsoever. But I can tell you one thing. They knew Felice Avidad. <laughs> they could sing that, and I was lost as a goat, but they knew it. <laughs> Amen. I, I noticed we're, we're probably losing something a little bit, too. The things that my generation takes for granted. But we were introduced to Christ when we were young. A lot of us got saved. How many of you got saved when you were less than 18 years of age? Raise your hand. Look at that. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. But here's the problem that I, I seem to face, and please hear me. I'm not trying to be critical, but I, I think sometimes we take for granted the salvation that we have in God, and we stop searching for Christ. How many people are, call themselves Christians today that are not in places of worship? How many people that are calling themselves Christians today, are, are they truly taking the Word of God and searching for Him? How many are being knocked to their knees and saying, Lord, I desperately need you and want you. I've got issues with my families. I have issues with work, and I want you to be God there. You see, I think we quit searching. We quit searching. And can I confess a little bit? Wasn't too long ago, we love dogs at our house. I married a wonderful woman. She's a dog person. I'm going to get in trouble, but I don't care. I'm not a cat person. If you're a cat person, bless you in Jesus' name. <laughs> I don't mean that rudely. Be a cat person. Just don't bring them to my house because my dogs will eat them. Amen. <laughs> but I remember we had puppies, and, and puppies will get gone. Can y'all say amen to that? And in our, where we live, we live up on kind of a top of a hill, and there's, we, we have woods all around us, and, and, and it's, it's a beautiful place, but those puppies can travel in a hurry, can't they? And we were going through the woods and through the pastures and past the creek and everywhere else, hunting them. And I got thinking, if I searched for people who don't know Christ as much as I search for those puppies, and if I searched for God in my every day, as much as I had a desire to search for those puppies, how things could be different. Now, once again, we're in church, and we say we're supposed to do that, right? The thing is, is I think that we don't search for them like we probably used to or should. Are you hungry? Are you hungry for the things of God? Or are you okay? Have you settled in? For those people who say, I got it, the one thing I know is you don't. But for those who say, I don't have it, I know that you're hungry for more. One of the sad things in church is that we'll miss people for about six months, and it'll pop up again. Something will go on in their life, and then we'll, they'll come back to church, and I'm grateful for that. But I wish that they would seek for the Lord all the time. Seek for Him. Hunt for him. Don't rest on what you learned 40 years ago. What are you doing for him today? Follow God's leading. He put signs in front of you. He put a star up there. That wasn't a big deal. But he put a star up there just for them. And you know what amazes me? When they left Herod and they're going down to Bethlehem, the star was right there all along. And it led them to Bethlehem. But get this, this is months after the birth. They're not in the manger. Some scholars say maybe up to a year. I don't think it was up to a year. But I believe it was months after the birth. And get this, that star led them exactly to the place where they found Christ. You think God is able to lead us exactly to where we need to? If we'll open up our eyes to it, I believe so. I believe he's exact. He's exactly, and get this, he's right where he always said he would be. Micah 5, 2 said Bethlehem. He was right there. Over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament 
from 400 to 1,200 years before Christ was born were fulfilled in Christ. Things like where he would be born, how he would die, that his parents would take him to Egypt. When we get to the end of this story today, that, that these wise men, when they left and went home, they were warned by an angel to go a different way. They didn't go back and tell Herod. So Herod went out and, and started killing the children two years and younger because he wanted to kill his rival. But where did he go? They took him to Egypt. But Scripture said even then he would come up out of Egypt. That his parents would raise him in Nazareth. These are things that Jesus could not have controlled. But it's exactly what the Word of God says. I want you to know with the same certainty, Daniel was right, and the book of Revelation is right, and the gospel story is right. There is a heaven, and there is a hell. And if you so choose God through Christ, you can have heaven forever. But if you do not want to be with God, if you do not want to follow that way, if you want to seek after a different truth, you will be separated from God forever in a place that the Bible calls hell. Hell. It speaks more of hell than it does heaven. And it talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not my words. That's the word of God. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. But that's the story of Christmas. The story of Christmas is God's love, the Savior to come. But yet if we reject such a gift, when the wise men came and found him exactly the way that he was supposed, just the way the Word of God said, they brought gifts. They were prepared. Gold fit for a king. Frankincense that was used in the worship of God. Not just king, but God. They said, not only is he the one who to be king of the Jews, he is the God who came for them, the one true God. And myrrh. Oh, myrrh. The fruit of a, a thorny tree. If you look and got it, it would look kind of like a pine tar that would get on your hands, a resin. But if you took the bloom of the tree, listen to me now, and you crushed it. You took the bloom in your hands and you crushed it. The smell would be released. And this beautiful stuff would come from it. It was extremely important in that society. It had many uses. But we know it as one where they would anoint the dead. The perfume covered the smell, but it was the worship or the transition to the next life. Crushed, showing what our Savior would do for us. We have a king who is God, who is Savior. So I think this. I should seek him. And if you do, you will find him if you search for him with all your heart, Jeremiah 29. And you can love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can allow him to be the king of your heart and the king of your life. You can bow no knee to no other. One day when we get to heaven, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's king. And we get the opportunity today to make him king in our life. But we also have the opportunity to bring that fragrance of frankincense of worship. And we can worship him everywhere we go. Praise God, you can worship him in this building. You can worship him in any building. You can worship him inside. You can worship him outside. You can worship him on the best of days. You can worship him on the worst of days. He is worthy of your worship. But he's also Savior, the one who was crushed so that you could have life. He'll take you from here to there. He is blessed. He is Lord. But don't keep that just for yourself. If he's Savior, 
He saved you. If you've received his grace and his mercy, that's to be given away. How selfish we would be to be the recipients of such grace and never wanting to share it with someone else who were in need. Church, we must be. We must be. We have to be. I'll say it this way. We should be. In love. So in love. So ready to give our life away every day. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. He came and bled for you and me. He gave his life's blood. Oh, what a Savior. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for coming. Thank you for being crushed. Thank you, Lord, that it didn't end that way, but the bloom of salvation is new life. Father, thank you for loving us the way that we are, for giving us where we are, and giving us the hope that you place within us. Father, you're not mad at us. Bless you for that. You so much want so much for us. Father, may we not get in the way, but may we receive the great gifts that you have for us. I pray that today we will let you be king. That we will confess you as God and receive you as Savior. You're still the one that's seeking. Lord, I think about the story that those wise men told when they went home. I know they didn't go home and just keep it to themselves. They told everyone that they, could, that they came in contact what they had found when they found the Christ child. Lord, may that be our mission. May that be our joy. May that be our life. Until we see you face to face, may we be about your business. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.